Before we discuss the important principles in this lecture, I want to quickly familiarize you with a way to alternatively represent organic molecules. Up until this point, we've been looking at Lewis dot structures. But what I'd like you to know is that we can also represent this molecule this way. In fact, in organic chemistry, the bottom way to represent this molecule is going to be the preferred way. And I just want to quickly show you how to interpret this bottom structure. First of all, he's called the condensed structure. And it's very simple. All we're saying is that this carbon right here is this carbon here. And the three hydrogens attached to the carbon are simply condensed or collapsed to right here. Looking at the representation below, we'd have to know that those three hydrogens are connected to the carbon to the left. For the next carbon in the top representation, this one right here, this carbon right here would be this carbon here, and the two hydrogens attached to him would be these two hydrogens down here. And lastly, for this carbon over here would be this carbon down here. His three hydrogens here are collapsed down to these three hydrogens here. And while we're looking at this molecule, I'd like you to also know that it's what's called an alkane. An alkane is a molecule that has only carbon and hydrogen, sometimes called hydrocarbons, and all of the carbons in the molecule are sp3 hybridized. Now that we got this down, let's use alkanes to help us better understand intermolecular forces and how they dictate physical properties of organic molecules. And here's one of the things I want you to know, the relationship between molecular weight, boiling point, and melting point of alkanes. And here it is, the higher the molecular weight, the higher the boiling point, and also the higher the melting point. We need to remember this about alkanes. But we should also understand why this is the case. But before we go into the why, I just want to quickly show you one more way to represent organic molecules. Again, remember this is our Lewis structure. To help me better explain the principles in this lecture, we're going to want to think about this molecule as this representation. This is called the Bond Line Formula. And here's how we interpret it. These three carbons right here would be these three points right here. So here's how you could think about this bond line formula representation. It's just a trace of the carbons within an alkane. And notice we're not showing any of the hydrogens. The name of this compound happens to be propane. We'll go into more depth of bond line formulas in a later online lecture. But to just make sure you got this, I'm also going to talk about this molecule right here. This is his Lewis dot structure, and this right here would be his bond line formula. And again, the five carbons here in this chain would be these five points down here. The name of this compound happens to be pentane. So again, in this representation, we really only care about the length of the carbon chain of the molecule. So let's look at an example here. Let's say I have two molecules, one each in a beaker. I have propane over here and I have pentane over here on the right. Let's see why one of these would have a higher boiling point than the other. So let's look at the propane first. Remember, we don't have just one propane molecule in the beaker. We have many propane molecules, like this. And what's happening here is that these propane molecules are being held together by what's called intermolecular forces. In general chemistry, we learned about these, and these type of intermolecular forces happen to be called induced dipole, induced dipole interactions. Or you can call them van der Waals forces. And even another name, some textbooks refer to them as London dispersion forces. It's these forces that keep all the propanes held together in a liquid form. And in order to get propane to evaporate, you would need to add heat. And heat would need to break these intermolecular force bonds right here, enabling the propane to evaporate out of the solution as a gas. If that's the case, now let's analyze pentane the same way. Again, these would represent the intermolecular forces. Notice, compared to propane, pentane has a greater number of intermolecular forces per molecule. So that means to evaporate pentane, 
adding the heat, we'd have to break more intermolecular force bonds to get him to evaporate. Pentane is going to have a higher boiling point and propane is going to have a lower boiling point. It simply takes more energy to separate the pentane molecules than it does to separate the propane molecules. And higher energy therefore means a higher boiling point. So that explains that trend there. That's why an increased molecular weight corresponds to a higher boiling point. And what we saw also can be applied to melting point. Again, the higher the molecular weight, the higher the melting point for the same reasons. The more intermolecular forces you have, the higher temperature it takes to melt something. But there's another relationship between the structure of an alkane and its boiling point. And I'd like you to know that. And that's basically this right here. Branching. How does that affect boiling point? Well, what I'd like you to know is that more branching causes a lower boiling point, but increases the melting point. We also want to remember this trend. And let's understand this one as well. Let's say again I have two samples here. I have straight chain pentane and in another beaker I have neopentane. Neopentane is just the common name for this molecule. Notice it happens to have five carbons. That's why it's a pentane and it's very branched. So let's look at the analysis here. In the left beaker of pentane, remember, we have a bunch of it here and they're all connected by their intermolecular forces. And remember, in order to evaporate or boil off pentane, we need to add heat. Heat needs to go in and break all of these intermolecular force bonds here. Now let's do the same analysis to neopentane. Let's say we have more than one here in our beaker. And notice, because of his branching, there's going to be less overlap of the molecules. Therefore, there's going to be less number of intermolecular forces to connect these two molecules. In this case, we see only one. So that means in order to boil or evaporate neopentane, you add heat and therefore need to break less intermolecular force bonds. So that's the effect of increased branching. This means that straight chain pentane is going to have a higher boiling point and neopentane is going to have a lower boiling point. Now let's go back to our trend here. What we're seeing here is increased branching corresponds to a higher melting point. Even though we just saw it corresponds to a lower boiling point. How do we resolve this? Well let me show you how this makes sense. Let's say again we have our neopentane here a very high branching molecule in a beaker and let's place a whole bunch of it in here. Now think about it. Melting point is when you go from a solid to a liquid. And what I want you to see here is that the more branching you have, think about it, the molecule becomes more compact. And the more compact the molecule, the more easy it is to pack them together in a lattice framework such as a solid. This is why increased branching leads to higher melting points. So basically the increased branching increases the ability to pack this molecule together so therefore it takes more energy, a higher melting point, to separate these molecules into the liquid phase. So that's why we observe this particular trend. Another interesting point about melting point in alkanes is that an alkane with an even number of carbons have higher melting points than alkanes with an odd number of carbons. And this is also for the same reason. It just so happens that alkanes with an even number of carbons can pack themselves together better than having an odd number of carbons. Now, just to be sure here, let's understand how alkanes could have intermolecular forces in the first place. For instance, let's look at propane right here. And let's pretend this happens to be his molecular orbital, which means the electrons around him could be anywhere in this vicinity. Remember, because alkanes are made up of carbon and hydrogen, there's not a big difference in the electronegativity of carbon and hydrogen. So there's no polarity, no polar bonds in this molecule which means alkanes shouldn't have a partially positive end and a partially negative end to their molecule. 
In other words, they shouldn't have a dipole moment. However, what happens when you happen to have a bunch of, let's say, propane in a beaker, there is a chance that one of the propane molecules could have all of its electrons just randomly on this side of the molecule. Let's see what would happen as a result of this. Let's put him over here. And first, let's note that he would have one side of the molecule partially negative where the electrons are, and the other side would be partially positive. If we place him next to another propane molecule, then the electrons on the first molecule will repel the electrons in the second molecule to the other side like this, which and then creates a dipole for this molecule. And again, the molecule even next to him, the same thing would happen. The electrons would be repelled to one side, creating a dipole, one side negative, one side positive. This is actually what happens when you have a bunch of alkanes together, and this is how they can possibly form intermolecular forces. And these intermolecular forces are called induced dipole, induced dipole interactions. Don't just memorize that. Think about that name. That's exactly what we're doing. One molecule is inducing a dipole in the other. And remember, we also call these van der Waals forces. So this is how alkanes could exist in either a solid or liquid phase in the first place.